We are back on the Zero Hour, continuing with our coverage of Pope Francis's visit to the United States. Pope Francis on Thursday, of course, addressed the Congress of the United States. And here to help us uh, dissect and reflect on that talk is Sally Steenland. Sally Steenland is the director of the Faith and Progressive Policy Initiative at the Center for American Progress. And she is also a former journalist, among many other uh, accomplishments. And she joins us now. Sally, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Let's start before we talk about the Pope a little bit. So what is the Faith and Progressive Policy Initiative? What, what do you guys do? So we're part, we're an integral part of the Center for American Progress, which is a progressive think and action tank, which is what we call ourselves in Washington, D.C. And since its beginning, CAP as a progressive institution has always had a faith team because although we're not a faith-based organization, we know that religion and faith is an important force in America, both in people's personal lives and in the public square, and that it can be used for good or evil, and that our, the work that we do uh, aims to work with faith-based advocates on social justice and to use faith uh, as, a, as a unifying factor rather than as a weapon and to call us to our higher selves so that we can all work together, whether we're people of faith or not. Well, I think that's absolutely great. And I also like the emphasis on policy as well as faith in the, in the name of your initiative, because, of course, faith without good works is dead, right? <laughs> Said that I think his name was James. Right. right. Well, you know, a long time ago. I didn't make it up. I know that you didn't make it up, right? right. So, so listen, Pope Pope Francis came to uh, came to Washington D.C. He spoke to Congress. Uh, he had to know, among other things, the political composition and uh, of Congress and some of the leanings of some of the uh, members there, uh, both those who might agree with him and, and who might not. And was it your impression, as it was mine, that he had very much uh, tempered his remarks to that audience? What, what I was so impressed by when I watched him was I thought his speech was kind. I thought it was um, uplifting. I thought he appealed to our better selves without being soft. It wasn't just, a, you know, a Hallmark card, no offense against Hallmark, but he <laughs> raised very urgent issues and things that, and, and called things out for what they were, but he didn't scold us. Um, and he was very gracious. Uh, I, he, you know, it, he was a guest in our country, and um, he, he. I mean, I just thought he was really very kind and inspiring. And and my hope, of course, is that he and he and he didn't fall into a partisan trap of either one side or the other. He appealed to everybody in a really plain English, common sense way. And I think my hope and the hope of many of us is that that unifying force will not evaporate um, and that we will translate his words into action when he goes home. You know, he said several things, and that's very well said. He said several things that struck me and i do agree he was extremely courteous to his hosts and to he his was. Yeah. he really was he let us off the hook i was expecting i was expecting maybe i would squirm um in a good way right I no no i mean in a good way all of us but he didn't do that i i i, I had exactly the same reaction <laughs> sally steenland but I, I i do have to say that that said when i went back and read the transcript there were several things he said that resonated maybe with a, a reverberation afterwards uh, that were interesting. I wanted to point so a couple of them out to you. Sure. Uh, he said, for example, uh, in the very first re opening remarks, the figure of Moses leads us directly to God and thus to the transcendent dignity of the human being. Moses provides us with a good synthesis of your work, meaning your work, Congress, you are asked to protect by means of the law the image and likeness fashioned by God on every human face. Yeah. Uh, and first yeah. of all, beautifully phrased, I think. Beautiful. Beautiful. It, but, and isn't he also saying, in effect, that while you know, while he may have been gentle with us and with Congress, which I think is what, one of our conclusions, isn't he saying, in effect, that you have you Congress, since he was addressing Congress at that point, uh, have a moral obligation to each and every human being in your care. And absolutely, absolutely. 
And and he, you know, he named people. He named the young. He named the elderly. And he said, "Don't be afraid of foreigners. Do not be afraid of them." We we all came from another place in this country. And then he really spelled out the golden rule. You know, do unto others. But then he said, "This is what it means. If you want opportunity, if for yourself, you have to give it to others." And then he says that yardstick that we use for uh, that time will then use that our yardstick for us and judge and see how 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 well we did. But he really spelled it out. So in other words, think of what you want for yourself, your family, and your children. Think of what that is. You need to give that to other people, to the poor in this country, to immigrants in this country, to migrants who are coming from other countries. We're all a human family. And he mentioned the common good time and time again. And I want to get to the common good because that was an important theme. We're talking with Sally Steenland, who is director of faith at the Faith and Progressive Policy. Policy initiative at the Center for American Progress. He uh, he did something else very interesting, Sally, which is again while being polite and gentle, he talked about extremism, and I wondered. Yes, fundamentalism I, and extremism. Yes. Yeah, he said. Yeah, he said we know that no religion. Now, now we know we're, 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 there, there is a problem of Islamophobia in this country, and and I, I would argue in the Republican Party, uh, he we know there is also xenophobia. He addressed that. Shame Donald Trump wasn't in the room. I guess when he was talking about, it. <laughs> but uh, he says uh, we know that no religion is immune from forms of individual delusion or ideological extremism. That means we must be especially attentive to every type of fundamentalism. Interesting end to the sentence, whether religious or any other kind. Um, Was he talking about the uh, kind of Tea Partyism there, you think? You know, I I, I I responded the same way you did. I, and what I, when he said that, I thought, this is a very sophisticated speech. It really is smart and sophisticated. It's not just bromides and platitudes, because what he's really talking, and he talks about, he talks about complexity, and he says, don't be simplistic and reduce the world to white hats and black hats, sinners and saints. Don't do that, because that's not what the world is like. And I think he was talking about not just religious uh, extremism, but political ideologies and economic ideologies. Mm-hmm. And he talked about intellectual freedom and individual freedom and religious freedom, all three of those. So in other words, it's the freedom to think and to be an independent thinker and to challenge the ideologies of the day, which is a freedom of intellect and conscience, which is which is Jesuit, you know, like what Jesuit, of course, would say that, which is very, very important. Don't just swallow whole whatever you've been taught, but intellectual freedom is core to being human. You know, and the other thing I want to say, I'm looking at that um, uh, uh, foreigner thing that I said before. The way he (laughs) phrased so much of this is um, positive. And so he says, we do not, we are not fearful of foreigners because most of us were once foreigners. I say this to you as a son of immigrants, knowing so many of you were descended from immigrants. So in other words, he, he's stating it all in a positive. So if you like want to get off that bus and you have to say, uh, no, like I am afraid of foreigners. So he, <laughs> his inclusive positive statement is a hard thing to disagree with. Absolutely. Now let's talk about briefly about what he didn't say. We're talking with Sally Steenland, who is director of the Faith and Progressive Policy Initiative at the Center for American Progress. He did not, as he has on other occasions, quote the medieval theolo- theologian as saying, what was it, that money is the dung of the devil? <laughs> He, I know. I wait. I kept waiting for him to, <laughs> to talk about unfettered capitalism and the throwaway economy that enslaves people and all the rest. And, and the idolatry of money, which is an idolatry like that of worshiping the golden calf. He did right. not. I must admit, I was a little disappointed he didn't rock them with a little of that. <laughs> I know. I I was waiting for that. And you know, somebody had said there was a there was a strong sentence in there, and I'm looking for it right now about economic inequality. That that was in the draft, that was in the, uh, and that he didn't say, and the Vatican said, or the bishop said, oh, that was just an oversight, he didn't, it was, a, it was like a, a, a sharper thing, to your point, that he, that it's in the text, but he didn't say it. Um, but, he, because in other times, uh, he has been, um, 
he's been pretty strong in the in in talking about um, unfettered capitalism as uh, being very destructive globally uh, and are being enslaved to uh, an economy that just produces more and more and makes us consumers rather than just human beings. Yeah, a very, um, yeah, a, a very at the same time, radical and sensitive and complex, in my opinion, uh, interpretation of the relationship between the individual and, and our prevailing economic system. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's at, and also someone coming from a continent and from a country that has seen things that we not necessarily may not have seen in America as a first world country that has borne the brunt of some of the global economic decisions. Um, and also because we were we are a first world country and we've got a lot of stuff. We've got more than we need and we can share a little bit better. And I, I was wondering if he was going to say, anything about that. And the way he talks about that, again, is in a hopeful, inspiring way, so you don't feel like you want to hang on to your stuff and like you're being scolded. But, you know, he, the, he's, his visit isn't over, and he's spoken about this before, and he'll speak about this again. Um, so there's no question where he stands on economic inequality and extreme poverty and those at the margins. Um, there's no question. And while we're talking about this, Sally Steenland, here's something else that struck me about Pope Francis's address to Congress, and it probably, I'm guessing, went by, went right past a lot of the Republicans. But, <laughs> but in talking about, uh, you know, he name-checked four Americans. Yes. The, Abraham Lincoln, okay, expected. Martin Luther King, wonderful, expected. Dorothy Day and Thomas Merton. Now, for uh, for our uh, listeners who might not be familiar with those names, that, I thought that was an extraordinary thing to do. Dorothy Day, ca- Catholic socialist. I believe her, if I remember correctly, I meant to look this up. I think the Catholic Worker was the name of her publication. Catholic Worker movement. She's part of the Catholic Worker movement. Right. And I think it was the Daily Catholic Worker that they sold for a penny. Right, on the street. And the street, and right. uh, absolute dedicated uh, Catholic socialist Thomas Merton, the great uh, Trappist monk, writer, author of The Seven Story Mountain. And, yeah, uh, mystics. Gr- Thinker, You're right. contemplative, who's influenced the world. Studied yeah. meditation techniques in a multiplicity of traditions. Died in Thailand researching uh, uh, meditation there. So, uh, what was the message there? You think? I was really glad he included a woman. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, Dorothy Day, by her life, I mean, just like the Pope sends a strong message when he travels in his little fiat, that sends, like, what more do you have to say than traveling in a in a, a small car rather than a really big car? Dorothy Day, living in solidarity with the poor, taking on voluntary poverty and finding great joy uh, in service to the least of these and the most vulnerable, and, and actually sharing uh, a roof with them, um, holding her up as a model uh, is profound. It's profound in this age of extreme individualism, of material acquisition, of prosperity gospels and thinking that the more you have, the more God has blessed you. It just turns that on its head, and really the last shall be first. And Thomas Merton really celebrates many things, but certainly um, a religious, uh, the life of the mind, uh, intellect, meditation, and pluralism. And you know, in his speech, he talked about pluralism as well, which again, I think is really sophisticated, that we, in in order for all of us to live together, uh, we need to respect other faiths. And, And what I, you know, what I loved what he did so much. When he was finished with his speech, he went out to the west side of the Capitol, and there were all of these people waiting for them. He spoke in Spanish, uh, buenos dias, and then he asked people to pray for him. And he said, you know, and if you don't have faith, or if you don't pray, or are unable to mm. pray, just send me good wishes. That's, Which yeah. was so great! It was great! Yeah, so he, Everybody was included. Absolutely. Now, now, he also said, um, at the risk of oversimplifying, we might say we live in a culture which pressures young people not to start a family, because because they lack possibilities for the future. Yeah, Yet yeah. the same culture presents others with so many options that they too are s- dissuaded from starting a family. He sounded like my grandmother there. It's, it, <laughs> when am I getting grandkids? The, what are you waiting 
for. Right. What's keeping you? Um, yeah. yeah. She, neither of them, my grandparents are alive right now, but but uh, when they were, that seemed to be the constant nerd. Um, so what was he driving at there, you think? So it seemed that he was talking about both extremes. And for people who would like to start families but don't have a job that pays a living wage or don't have affordable housing or don't have health insurance or affordable child care or paid sick leave or whatever it is that families need to thrive and to raise children with dignity, um, those things should not be standing in the way for people who have the desire and the love to start families. And I think at the other end of it, he was maybe talking about um, the importance of family and of uh, of the simplicity and the essentiality of family, and that it, it, for, for those uh, on the more affluent scale, we can be distracted by so many shiny, sparkly things, chasing the next thing, and treating almost partners as commodities, like, well, she's okay or he's okay, but maybe something better will come along. Right. And that that's not a way to live either. Um, those are not good values to have either. So he was addressing both, I think. And and the last point, it seems, Sally Steenland, that he went very light on the um, the areas where he might get a lot of disagreement, even from American Catholics, much less the American public, uh, in terms of uh, birth control and those sorts of things. Now, he did... Uh, uh, at least in this speech now, he did show support for the uh, group of nuns that's resisting the uh, uh, the birth control yeah, uh, he talked about, right. in Obamacare, uh, the birth coverage in, in Obamacare. But, but uh, I, I thought he went very gently on that. What did you think? Yeah, yeah I thought, uh, and when he spoke at the White House, uh, during the welcoming ceremony on Wednesday, he talked about religious liberty, but he, and again, in a complex way, where he also talked about the importance of preserving individual uh, human rights and civil rights. And so he balanced that out. It wasn't just um, a blanket statement. And when he talked about life, where, which could have gone anywhere. He could have talked a lot about, you know, the sanctity and the dignity of life. What he talked about in great detail was the death penalty, and he was pretty specific. Um, so that's where he chose to, you know, put the weight of his remarks about the dignity of life. I think, you know, I'm on the progressive side, and I just need to be careful that I don't want to just, you know, have my Pope checklist to make him the mascot for the things I agree right. with, and then discard him and disregard him for the things I don't agree with. I don't, I don't like it when conservatives do that, and I don't want to do that either. And there are things we disagree with, and um, that's that. That's fine. <laughs> he doesn't. We don't. We don't need ultimate. And the other right, thing is, right. He's I understand what you're saying. He's not afraid of it. He airs it. And even in the, you know, the, the, the months uh, uh, approaching the summit when there was huge disagreement in the Vatican about, about family and being more open towards LGBT families, and that was taken out of the final draft, and we'll see where it ends up. He didn't shy away from that. He welcomes it as fresh air. Yeah, and I think that's why people have uh, reacted so well to him, because uh, and because I think his, his opinions come from a, a fundamental moral core, and you may not disagree with all of them, but each of the threads in it adds up to a tapestry that has integrity. So I think uh, I think people respect that. And unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there, but Sally Steenland, oh. Director of the Faith and Progressive Policy Initiative at the Center for American Progress, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thank you so much. Great to talk. Same here.